who of you went to school and had uh, economics while at school? Yeah, a lot of you, eh? Question, another question. Who had you, of you had teachers that told you honestly that the economics that you were being taught was creating crisis after crisis after crisis? <laughs> well, this, this basically summarizes my talk today. <laughs> um, I'm a, I, my name is Kees Klomp. I'm a professor of applied science at the Rotterdam University of Applied Science. And I'm researching uh, economic system change. And I am helping to change the curriculum of the business school. Um, and that pretty much starts and boils down to debunking economy. We spend a lot of time unlearning economics as we know it. And I'm going to share uh, a couple of insights with you in this talk. So um, what you might not know or be aware of is that most of us spend most of our time in a self-created prison of commodity called the economy. So most of us are all living in the blue bubble in the middle, the economy. Um, market world, you could say. And let me take you through a couple of characteristics of that bubble. So let me start with, with us as human beings. So without you maybe being aware, most of our time, we spend our time as material beings. Yeah, so I, I, I certainly hope I don't offend anyone with this, but all I can see from up here are wallets. You are sitting wallets. This, this country, the Netherlands, is like any other country in the world, governed on the basis of GDP, gross domestic product. And gross domestic product means the total sum of all economic activities in this country, which basically means that you only exist if something enters or leaves your wallet. You, you're not human beings, you are material beings. Quite inconvenient, eh? Uh, and let's look at the way that we perceive society. So the Netherlands, like, again, almost every country in the world is a welfare nation. So our, our society, our civilization is based upon welfare, on wealth. So the basic idea is that if wealth goes up, if living standard goes up, our well-being goes up. Which is not the case. Did you know that in the Netherlands, our economy has grown 300% since the 1960s? Can you imagine? We are three times richer than we were in the 1960s. But at the same time, our well-being and our happiness didn't increase one bit. And to, put it even, uh, to make it even worse, we, it, it, it is even showing a decrease in the last couple of years. And so what's the use? of making more money and more money and more money if it doesn't make us more happy, more happy, more happy. Uh, we don't think about these questions. And then last but not least, there is probably no better way to show our distorted relationship with nature uh, that we take for granted. So we, the only way that we humans, we uh, material human beings, can have a relationship with nature is based upon capital. We treat nature as capital. If we can put a price tag on nature, if we can use nature for our human purposes in the economy, if we can turn nature into a commodity and use it for the economy, we value nature. It's instrumental. Whereas, of course, nature has an intrinsic value. We are only one of the millions and millions and millions of species on this, li on this living planet. We don't own nature, we are nature. So when you hear a couple of, um, uh, of examples like this, um, you might uh, uh, understand that this crisis that we're in didn't come as a surprise. We've caused it ourselves. So the economy is the root cause of almost all the big societal problems that we are facing at this moment. So it's the economy that is creating climate change. It's the economy that is creating biodiversity collapse. It's the economy that's creating deforestation and acid, uh, ocean acidification. It's the economy that's that is creating perverse wealth inequality. 
It's the economy that creates political polarization. And it's the economy that creates depression and burnout. It's all based upon the idea that our economy constantly needs to grow and we constantly have to feed the beast that is creating this crisis. And now, this crisis is, is getting way out of control. We are, and the, the, the science is crystal clear, we are on a death path. Our, our existence is, uh, is at risk. And even more, this crisis is becoming existential. And this is, and this is really, really, really important. So the societal is becoming personal. So a lot of people suffer from a collapse of worldview and self-image. It, we are hitting rock bottom. And that is great news. And that is great news, because no pain, no gain. We will only change if the pain is hard enough. And we're reaching that point uh, with each other. And you can, uh, we can already see it. There is a growing group of people, especially young people, Generation Y and Generation Z, and I can see a lot of them here in the, in the, uh, in the hall, the millennials and the centennials, that are actually stand up and, uh, and demand system change. And you're absolutely right. Uh, we see a lot of new uh, uh, students also in our university that are transforming societal urgency into personal agency. We see a lot of young people that turn or transform their awareness of the alarming state of the world into activism. And this is the engine that drives system change. This is the engine that is creating this thing, this new phenomena, this new economic theory that I call existential uh, economics. Uh, so if you look at economics, in almost all cases, economics is nothing more than human behavior. Yeah? So what, what sort of behavior is existential economics about? Well, what we see, and this is part of my research, is a process that is about merging a sense of belonging with a sense of becoming. So we see more and more young people, especially young people, that uh, experience a sense of being part of something bigger than themselves. And so I interviewed literally hundreds of social entrepreneurs in the last couple of years and change makers and what they all have in common, without any exception, is that in their stories, they had this moment of, of calling. They were being called. And so they all have a, a story wherein a certain societal problem became personal for them. You know, they, they attracted, they embodied this societal issue and it became personal. And this is what people describe as experiencing purpose. And so purpose is sometimes treated as a noun, which is not. It's a verb. It's a sensory experience. Yeah. So people experience purpose when they feel connected to other people and to the planet. And once people start to behave in relationship to that, to that intention, to that cause that they have embodied, that is what people describe as, as experiencing a sense of meaning. Yeah? So that is the economic flow that is happening. And if you turn that into the macroeconomic perspective of um, uh, existential economics, um, you could say it's based upon the Ubuntu principle. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Ubuntu. Yeah? I am because we are, and we are because the planet is. Yeah? So what existential economic do is doing is introducing ecology to economics. Yeah? So what we have learned, or what we can learn from ecologists, is the acknowledgement that species and living beings don't only uh, uh, compete, but also cooperate in ecosystems. Yeah. So ecosystems, thriving ecosystems, are about symbiosis and mutualism, about species joining forces to create uh, situations that are conducive to each and every species within that ecosystem. 
And this is basically what we are now learning also in economics. So it's not money that makes the world go round, it is life. And it is life that we need to service um, in the uh, economy. Yeah, so uh, my, um, my take on things is that I think we should stop calling economics economics. I think we should call it applied ecology, economically applied ecology. If you take the Earth and you zoom out in outer space, yeah, can you see it? The blue dot in the black void, there is no economy anymore. But ecology remains. Yeah, life remains. So we have to align economics to the principles of ecology. And ecology shows us, life shows us, processes and patterns for billions of years. And the only thing that we have to do is take these processes serious and align to them. Yeah? So that means that the basis of existential economics is that it is life-centered. Yeah? So what you can see up here is the evolution of economics as we know it. So if we start at the bottom, then you can see our current way of looking at economics. So the Dutch economics, like any other country in the world, is based upon the neoclassical premise. Yeah? So the economy is there to fulfill our material needs. Because the idea is, if we can fulfill our material needs, we're happy. So that's why an economy can never be big enough or grow enough. The bigger, the better. Because the bigger, the more uh, 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 goods and services we can consume. And now, for the first time in history, because of climate change, we are um, evaluating or evolving into this second phase where we have world-centric or humanity-centric goals. We, ne we will never ever be able to tackle climate change if all the countries in the world only pursue the national interests and the individual interest of the people living in that national economy. So for the first time, we have agreements like, like Paris or Glasgow, we have to come together to transcend our national interest to reach global goals. But it's not enough. It is not enough. Because what ecology is teaching us is that we can't just look after our own species. We have to look after other species as well. As Einstein has taught us many years ago, that if the bee goes extinct, humans will go extinct in a couple of years later. Humans and bees coexist. We can't live without the bees. So we have to take care of all life on this planet. That is, that is what, we, what we need to do in the, um, in the next couple of years. We have to put life in the center of everything we do, also in business. And what does it mean? What does it mean for business? Well, it means that business is not anymore about maximizing profits, but about maximizing life. And the way we to do it is to stop focusing on shareholders and even stakeholders and start focusing on what is called rights holders. Yeah, so rights holdership is about taking every living thing on this planet into account. In, the, in our current economy, we have externalized almost everything, and in existential economics, we internalize as much as possible. Yeah, we try to get as much information we can into the company so we can look after the whole ecosystem rather than only looking after the um, financial results for a very selected bunch of shareholders. Yeah. So existential economic business is about creating integral value, or as my friend Rolf Thurm from the international think tank R3.0 calls it, realizing return on interbeing. Return on interbeing. Yeah, it's, it's based upon that old wisdom of Plato, who already said that the one can only be well unless the whole is well. That is our task. That is what we need to pursue. Put life in the center of each and every business. And what I want you to understand and, uh, and take home 
is that if we want to save the planet, we have to save the economy. We have to start the economy. Uh, and, and the good news is that an economy is nothing more <laughs> than a bunch of agreements made by people about how to run the human material household. Don't believe the hype that it is a natural law or a mathematical rocket science. It's none of that. It is 100% man-made. It is created. So we can recreate it. So I want to leave you with a simple question. Are we going to recreate the economy? Yes. Are we going to recreate the economy? Yes. Thank you.